Hello. Thank you so much for joining me. My name is Angel Russell. I'm a certified sex educator and I am coming to you from my kitchen. This is my a coronavirus quarantine office space where I have been working. And so while I normally love to come and give this lecture live, I am really excited to still have the opportunity to present the information to you. And I will make sure that I include my contact information because I do love dialogue and I do want to be able to answer your questions. So if we're going through this and you have questions about the content, please feel free to reach out to me and I will do my absolute best to get good answers for you. Who am I? I am a sexual assault victims advocate with the Women's Center of Jacksonville here in Jacksonville, Florida. I'm also a certified sex educator and I have my own space called ProfessorSex.com. It's an online space um, and I'll kind of explain more about all that and like what is this conversation that we're having. We are having a talk that I'm just generally right now calling the sex talk. This is sex ed that a lot of people did not get growing up but definitely deserved to have. What we have learned is that I think by the time you get into your adulthood or late adolescence, there's this assumption that you have had the sex education you need. And before that, there's a lot of hesitance to offer sex education because we don't want to talk to young folks about sex. And so it's like parents, educators, lawmakers miss they have such a weird idea about how sex education should be delivered that they miss that the window of time where they feel is appropriate. And a lot of people just don't get good sex ed. And so um, we're going to talk about sex education, why it's necessary. We're going to talk about what sex education looks like in the U.S. We're going to talk about where the gaps are a little bit. Um, and then we're also going to provide you some sex education. So let's kind of move forward a little bit. First, I'm just going to share with you a little bit about me. Um, so firstly, what is the Women's Center of Jacksonville? Uh, the Women's Center of Jacksonville has three main departments, their counseling department, where they offer um, counseling available to all folks who identify as female, LGBT folks, survivors of sexual assault of any gender and co-survivors of any gender. Um, so if you're interested in that counseling resource, um, definitely reach out. It's available to you. They also have a community education department where they do GED classes, English as second language classes, literacy classes, and then they have their Bosom Buddies Breast Cancer Support Group, which is pretty great. Um, and then also the rape recovery team, which is a 24 hour rape crisis hotline, personal and legal advocacy, advocacy for survivors and for co-survivors, and then also support groups for survivors and co-survivors. Um, and the rape recovery team, that's actually, uh, the team that I work for. So kind of what is my role as a victim's advocate? Uh, we do a lot. There's a, a group of us and um, we run the 24 hour hotline. So that is going to be answered by an advocate who can offer crisis intervention, information referrals. It's also a 24 hour response to survivors who want a medical forensic examination. So if someone has experienced an assault, they can call us and um, we can help facilitate their forensic exam. Information to assist survivors in understanding their rights and the options available to them. We do advocacy and accompaniment for medical proceedings and criminal justice proceedings. So we go with survivors into um, their medical and legal appointments related to um, things that happened around the assault. So we're there to be like a presence to support them. Information referral for community resources. We have um, that we the advocates are the folks who facilitate the support groups I talked about, and then we also help off uh, do the referrals for the counseling program. So if you're a survivor and you want counseling, we help do those referrals. We operate on an empowerment model, which comes out of a social work theory. Uh, basically, what sexual assault is it's it's not about sex; it's an act of power, and it's about exercising power and control over another person and taking that person's power away. And so, when somebody has been a victim of an assault the best thing that we can do for them is help help give them their power back. And so our model is very much about giving them choices and giving them their power. The best thing we can do is to reinstall that power. Uh, we, we are not rescuers. We are not fixers. That's not really what we do. We empower a person with all the options they have, and we help identify those options for them. And then they get to make choices, and they guide the choices. And so somebody who comes to us, they're the ones who drive the ship.
if you're local and you're listening to this, uh, you can volunteer uh, with the rape recovery team. Um, you can volunteer with Hotline. There's criminal justice stuff, community outreach, support groups, um, lots and lots of different ways to volunteer um, and intern too. We have internship opportunities. Um, so if you are interested in volunteering with the rape recovery team, you go to womenscenterofjax.org and click get involved and all the information will pull up. Or um, I'll, again, my email's in there. So just shoot me an email and I'll make sure to get you to the right person for volunteering. So um, it's a pretty cool place to volunteer. And the, there's a lot of options. So even if you're like, I don't know if I could run the hotline, you don't necessarily have to do that. There's lots and lots of ways to help out. And we're always looking for folks. So what is Professor Sex? Professor Sex is a sexuality education resource geared toward late adolescents and adults. So there are sex education resources out there for children and for parents. Um, and parents can definitely access what I'm doing. This is great information for parents. But my audience is older folks, older teens and adults. Um, some of the content I do can be adapted for teens and tweens. Um, like this lecture here, I'm going to be really careful not to use any um, like swearing or anything like that. Sometimes if you listen to the podcast, we drop like the F-bomb and stuff like that. But you're not going to hear that here. And so um, if you've come across content of mine and you think, oh, I really like this, but I wish it was a little I feel like it's a little much to show my teen, but I'd like them to have this information. Let me know and we'll see what we can do about getting uh, modified content um, out for you. So where there's a team of us as sexuality experts and relationship professionals. So it's me and I've got other folks who work with me that help me out. And we bring medically accurate, evidence-based, pleasure-inclusive, consent-focused, inclusive and affirming sex education. We do this across a variety of platforms. We do live lectures like this. We do, um, we have an online uh, discussion group. We're on social media and we have a YouTube channel. And then we're also the home of of a podcast called Sex from A to Z, which is hosted by me, um, Angel Russell. I'm the A in A to Z. And then my co-host is Dr. Robert Zeglin. He's the Z in Sex from A to Z. And we look at different pieces of sex research and break them down into everyday language, plain language. And then we also talk about the ways that professionals use that science to do their jobs. So it's a pretty cool um, podcast. We do a different piece of sex research every time. Um, or a different piece of re scientific research that applies to sexuality. And then we talk about how it connects all the ways to reach out to us, all the ways to find us. It's all at professorsex.com. And uh, so definitely head over there and check it out. All right. So before we get deep into it, let's go over what we're going to talk about. Uh, so our agenda for the day, we are going to be talking about different aspects of sexuality in very plain language. Um, I'm not really one to sugarcoat, and I think it's not helpful for people when we do that. So we're going to just be very straightforward. Um, and we are going to be talking about sex. Think of this as like a very like 101 level sex talk, like one of my um, teachers, one of my supervisors, she um, calls her version of this like not your mama's sex talk. And I love that. I think I'm going to try to see if she'll let me borrow that title because it's so good. Um, but yet that's kind of what this is. We can't cover everything because of time, because as much as I would love to keep you guys here for like 11 hours, that's not reasonable. So here's what we are going to cover. Anatomy and physiology, pleasure, consent and sexual assault, libido and arousal, sexual behavior and risk awareness around your sexual behavior. Um, because of time constraints, here are some things that we are not going to be able to talk about. So reproduction and birth control, we will not have time to talk about gender identity, sexual orientation, sexual identity generally, like those, that stuff is going to have to be another topic for another time. Um, we're not going to be able to spend a lot of time talking about specific sexual behaviors, but as we go through this, that stuff might come up for you and you might have questions, feel free to ask them. Um, and we're not going to be able to talk about like toys, fetish, fantasy, any of that. So those are things that definitely deserve to be in your sex education. We just don't have time to talk about them here. So what I'm going to do is make sure that we include a link to the PDF for the slides so that folks can um, download the slides. And if any of this information is like challenging to you as you're going through it, because again, like it can be, this stuff is really personal. And a, a lot of folks are not used to having like plain language talks about sexuality. So if any of this stuff is challenging for you, please take care of yourself. You can pause this. You can step away. If I was doing this live, I would tell people like you can get up and leave the room, take a lap. That's fine. I've also included information throughout the talk with resources and hotline numbers so that if you needed to talk to someone while you were going through this, you just realized, you know what? I need a little bit of um, crisis 
crisis intervention or I just need someone to talk to, uh, those numbers are there. So I've included locally women's, um, the Women's Center of Jacksonville, their rape crisis hotline is 24 hours. It's 904-721-7273. And that's here. And then if you are watching this, but you're not in Jacksonville, which is totally likely to happen, um, you nationally can call Rain's sexual assault hotline also 24 hours. That's 1-800-656-HOPE or 1-800-656-4673. So let's talk about sex ed. Why sex ed? Why do I make a point to list like medically accurate, evidence-based, pleasure inclusive, consent centric, inclusive and affirming. Like, why is that important? Let's talk about the state of affairs here in the U.S. And so this is all going to be data specific to the United States. There's currently no federally mandated standard for sex education. So there, the government has not said sex education needs to happen and this is how it needs to look. Only 22 states in D.C. mandate sex education at all. Only 13 states require that sex ed, if provided, must be medically accurate Yes, that's true. Um, that means that a lot of states do not have a requirement to offer medically accurate sex education. Only 18 states require information on contraception to be provided. And 37 states require that if sex education happens, information on abstinence has to be provided. And in 35 states, so 35 of those 37, it must be, you have to stress abstinence. So not just include abstinence information, but you have to stress it. So that's kind of the situation in the US. Uh, one in two sexually active youth will contract an STD by age 25. The US leads industrialized countries in teen pregnancy, birth, and abortion rates. So we are two times that of Canada and the UK and four times that of France and Sweden. And every 73 seconds, an American is sexually assaulted. That's the kind of stuff we're addressing um, here. So right now, the way that sex education is formatted in the U.S., um, and I do provide a longer talk on on sex education generally. So I'm going to give it very like a broad overview. But if you um, I will make sure to record content around like more robust content around sex education specifically, um, like the history of sex ed in the U.S. and like what that's about, because it is important and cool. So this is just very broad. Um, so most commonly what we see is what they call abstinence only or abstinence based. So abstinence only is education that stresses abstinence from all sexual behaviors. There's no information about contraception except in terms of like if it fails. Abstinence based has to emphasize the benefits of abstinence, but it can um, and include information about risk avoidance. Sometimes there is contraception and it's not just about like this is what happens when it fails. Like you actually get information about like different kinds of contraception. It's less common to see what they call a comprehensive sex education. And sometimes that is paired with abstinence, the abstinence based or abstinence plus. You'll see con uh, comprehensive. So that's age appropriate K through 12. I don't, I'm not aware of anywhere in the U.S. where they're doing a comprehensive K through 12 program in a public school setting. So if someone does know about that, please let me know because I'm just not aware of it. Um, but comprehensive meaning broad range of topics related to sexuality, including healthy relationships and consent, values, attitudes, and insights about sexuality. And then it's a little bit more sex positive than just the abstinence only, obviously. And to be comprehensive, it has to have accurate information. But a lot of times, um, again, because there's no like standard for that and nobody's checking in on it, just because a program is calling itself uh, comprehensive doesn't always mean that it is all of those things. And then very inconsistently, what you might see is what they call evidence based. And that's sex education that is possibly some combination of everything else we just talked about. And then um, the information it's giving you is proven through rigorous evaluation. So it's alongside empirical evidence about um, risk reduction, about sexuality. So um, what we're not seeing in any of this is any information about pleasure. What we're not seeing in any of this is um, education that's inclusive and affirming to um, different sexuality types. Most of the sex education in the U.S. is very much related to um, straight couples and procreative behaviors and sexual risk like STIs. And so it kind of all centers around um, that sort of those three buckets of information. And so that just doesn't apply to very many people. And even straight folks who procreate and don't want to have STDs, like that level of information just doesn't cover all their bases usually. So we want to do a little more. All right. 
So to have a conversation about sex and to have proper sex education, you have to be able to define sex. And I think that's part of the issue that comes up when we're talking about um, gaps in sex education is if you're working off of like a religious definition of sex versus like a CDC definition of sex versus like a porn definition of sex, like the phrase like sex or the, the word sex like has a lot of different um potential meanings. And so unless I'm going to say something like sexual penetration, which then it gets gets a little more specific, if I'm just saying like, oh, I had sex with that person or don't have sex with this person, that doesn't tell us a lot. So let's let's drill down to like, what even is sex? Let's start there because that's going to be the basis for the rest of the conversation. Uh, we're going to talk about what constitutes sexual behavior. We're going to talk about some myths and misconceptions. One of them we're going to talk about is virginity. Um, Another myth and misconception is that sex is only activities involved in reproduction. So we already talked about that. And that it's like penises and vaginas and things that just involve like a penis going into a vagina or trying to go into a vagina. And so that's um, another part of it. Um, so let's talk about virginity. So the first thing I want to talk about, um, when we a lot of the conversation around virginity is directed toward women or or anybody who has a hymen, a vagina and a hymen, and it's, oh, you don't pop your cherry is kind of the phrase we hear. And it's um, in reference to a, uh, a penetrative sexual act that breaks a, a person's hymen. That's not actually like how it works. It's not what happens. So um, what is the hymen? The hymen is like a stretchy membrane with layers like tissue paper, and it covers the vaginal opening. Everybody's hymen probably looks a little different than everyone else's, a little like snowflakes. Um, so I've got some pictures up here of like the way, the different ways that um, commonly uh, hymens are formed in the body. They're very stretchable. They're very strong and they're very repairable. So there is this idea that the hymen gets broken is a myth. Um, they stretch and tear to varying degrees and they usually heal quickly and heal on their own. Every once in a while they don't heal um, or like damage can be done to them and then medical intervention is usually required. And a lot of times what happens is uh, someone with a hymen is having pain during sex and they go to their doctor and they say, why is this hurting so bad? Why is sex hurting? And the doctor says, oh, there's some damage to your hymen we need to repair. And they go, I didn't know I had a hymen. I've been having sex and that's how they learn about this. But even then it's really, it's easy to repair and it's not life-threatening. There's also a lot of non-sexual ways that damage can occur to a hymen. So riding a bike, athletics, um, that kind of thing. And, and you hear that sometimes. So there's no virginity test. The hymen is not an indicator that someone has never had sex. Um, there's no such thing as a virginity test. Um, you can't look at someone's body and tell if they've ever had sex or how much sex they've had. Virginity is not a medical term. Virginity, you're not going to see the term virginity in your um, chart at the doctor's office. It is a social construct. So, um, whether or not you've had sex, how many people you've had sex with, the types of people you've had sex with, that is not a measure of your worth as a person. So if you are a person who believes that um, sexuality is a sacred thing, that it should be protected, that it should be offered um, only under certain conditions to certain people based on feelings you have about that person or other criteria, that is awesome. More power to you. Like do that thing. And if anybody ever shames you for that, like that is on them. Like nobody has any business in that decision, but you, uh, on the flip side, if you're the type of person that's like, yeah, sex is awesome. I want to have the sex and I want to do get adventurous and I want to get adventurous with other people. And again, cool, man. Like that doesn't, one person is not inherently better than the other person because of the different choices they're making. And if anybody is shaming you for making those choices, again, that's on them, not on you. That's a reflection of the person doing the shame. So the amount of sex you're having, um, is not related to your value as a person. Okay. So let's talk about the reality. So what is sex? Sex is from a physiological perspective. When we're talking about sex, we're talking about arousal, libido, desire, and we're also talking about your sexual response cycle. So things that engage, um, your, your desire for sex and things that engage your physiological response to sexual cues in your environment. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, it's typically defined as an especially intimate and personal activity between two or more people, but it's 
a level of intimacy that's typically a little bit more vulnerable than the way you would interact with an acquaintance or somebody that you thought of as um, a non-sexual friend or something like that. So it, it is kind of a unique type of intimacy, um, but it's defined by the participants. So it's very much up to the people doing the sex to define what sex is for them. So let's talk about defining consent. So a definition for sex, I'm going to use the Florida statutes. So definite legal definitions for consent and battery can change from state to state. I'm going to operate on the, I'm going to talk about the Florida statutes, but if you're like in a different state, you can just usually look it up. Um, so this is from Florida statutes. It says sexual battery means oral, anal, or vaginal penetration by or union with the sexual organ of another or the anal or vaginal penetration of another by any other object. And I added the brackets without consent because this is in the context of a larger document. However, sexual battery does not include an act done for a bona fide medical purpose. Groping or any wanted unsexual touch falls under sexual assault as well. So then same Florida statute, how are they defining consent? Consent means intelligent, knowing, and voluntary consent and does not include coerced submission. Consent shall not be deemed or construed to mean the failure by the victim to offer physical resistance to the offender. So just because the person doesn't resist or fight um, like physically with force does not mean that they have given consent. So, so let's talk a little bit more about defining consent because the sexual, the Florida statute language is a little clunky. So I like to use the acronym I'm safe. So I, I is informed consent. Informed consent is consent without deceit. Informed consent also includes making sure that people have all the information they need to consent to the thing that they're saying yes or no to. So, um, if I have kept withheld information from you, kept information from you, um, if you don't have all the information you need to know to say yes to this, your yes doesn't mean the same thing. So um, an example of that might be somebody who knowingly had an STI and then did not tell the person they were having sex with about their STI so that the people could offer so that the people could discuss barrier methods. So that would be one thing like keeping information from someone else. It's also like not giving people proper sex ed and not giving people the information they need. And then people are saying yes to things. Yes, I'll I can do that because they their perception of what's safe and what's risky and their perception of how their bodies work is not based on all the information they need. So I is informed consent. M is moment to moment. So consent is not a contract. It's an ongoing process. You can change your mind at any time. So uh, consent to going out to dinner is not consent to sex. Consent to oral sex is not consent to penetrative sex. Consent to playing with this sex toy is not consent to being tied up, like et cetera, et cetera. So um, consent is a conversation. It's ongoing. It's moment to moment. And you can stop, change your mind at any time. S is specific. So that kind of goes with moment to moment. Consent to one thing is not consent to all the things. So um, if I have said that I um, consent to um, having sex, uh, and again, the moment to moment and specific, they are really related. So if I'm saying like, oh, I'll have sex with you today, that does not mean, yes, I'll have sex with you tomorrow. Or oh, I'll have sex with you, this kind of sex with you. That doesn't mean I'll have every kind of sex with you, that kind of thing. So just remembering that like, it's not like a blanket statement and it's not a contract and you get to decide specifically what you're saying yes and no to. So the A is awake and aware. Someone who is asleep cannot give consent. So groping your sleeping partner is not a consensual behavior. Um, and I know some folks who are like, oh no, but I really like it when my partner... Uh, kisses me awake. When you're in a long-term relationship, how you've negotiated these things is one thing, but uh, you know, and I'm not in your bedroom, I'm not your bedroom police, but just remembering that an asleep person cannot give you consent. So if you are, especially in a newer relationship or like you're at a party and you're making out with somebody and they passed out, don't just keep going brand new relationship. Oh, Cosmo says, wake him up with a blowjob. If you haven't talked about that first and you haven't had that discussion and you haven't talked about like how that person might feel about that, don't do it. Asleep people cannot give consent. Um, also someone who is so intoxicated that they are not aware of what's going on cannot give consent. So having a couple of drinks while you're out to dinner, I know lots of people like to drink and party and have sex. And it's not realistic to say, don't ever consume illicit substances and have sex. Like that's not a realistic thing to tell people. And I used to teach a different acronym and I would include an S for sober. And I'm not, I felt like it was too um, confusing plus folks who were on like, 
like pain meds and that kind of thing. Like I, I think it's a little nuanced, but if you've got somebody who is stumbling down, cannot stand up, can't keep their eyes open, slurring their words, forgetting where they're at, acting in a way that's out of character for how they would typically behave. That person cannot give you informed moment to moment specific consent. That person's just not aware of what's going on. F is freely given. So that's consent that's offered without any coercion, without any manipulation. And so the Florida statute talked about coercion, like none of that. Um, no manipulation. If somebody's telling you no and you have to like convince them to have sex with you, that is not freely con given consent. No does not mean convince me. And then E is enthusiastic. So we also call this affirmative consent or yes means yes instead of no means no. So just because somebody didn't say no to you does not mean that they said yes. You want an enthusiastic participant to the behavior. So you want that person to be like, absolutely, yes, I'm totally a yes for this. So whether that's a verbal like yes, whether that's the yes body language, whether that's sexy texts, whatever that is, you want to know that person is enthusiastic about it. Sex should feel safe and enjoyable. And if it doesn't, you get to say no. Sex should feel good to you. Sex shouldn't hurt. Um, I mean, unless you want it to. And uh, it's okay to not want sex. And if you don't want sex, you can say no. You never owe anyone sex. Okay, so let's talk about our bodies now. So we've, we've kind of covered like what sexual behavior looks like what saying yes looks like, maybe what saying no might look like. Let's talk about uh, the body parts involved. Because again, having conversations about sex, part of informed consent is just like knowing the things you need to know to say yes and no. And a lot of folks just don't have a good understanding of their bodies. So we're going to do that. There is this awesome book called Come As You Are by Dr. Emily Nagoski. And if you ever read any book on sex education, this is the book to read. So the next few slides we're going to go through come from Come As You Are. So uh, basically what Emily Nagoski says, and this is true, we're all made of the same parts, just organized a little bit differently. So all of our anatomy is made of the same stuff. It's just shaped different. Uh, body parts are not inherently male and female. They're just biology. Gender is psychology. It's something else. And so I'm going to try to teach in a way that um, maybe understands that people connect these things to gender, but they're not inherently gendered. So why does it matter that all we're all made of the same stuff organized differently? What it means is that your genitals are normal. They're beautiful. They're amazing. They're captivating. They're wonderful. They are perfect. We are all made of the same parts as everyone else's. And that configuration is just unique to you. This is also true for all all of human sexual expression, genital response, fetish and vanity, sexual psychology, psychology and desires. It's all made of the same stuff. It's just organized differently. So um, a lot of the calls that I get from people are people who just want to know that they're normal. They're just worried that they're the only person who's feeling this thing and that they're the only person experiencing this thing. And that can be a really scary and alienating feeling. And uh, you're, you're normal. So unless something is giving you pain, in which case, you know, talk to your doctor. So unless something is hurting you or harming you or giving you pain, you're good. It's, it's okay. The variety is, is normal. Let's talk about the vulva. So this is Mulva. Uh, Mulva is my vulva puppet. Um, so your vulva is everything on the outside. So that includes your, um, labia majora that's the outer labia or outer like some people say lips of the vulva the inner labia right that's here and then the clitoral hood which covers the exposed part of the clitoris so your clitoral hood is here and then under the clitoral hood is the um clitoris or the exposed part of the clitoris you also have here this little rose that's the urethra and then the vaginal opening and then what you don't see on um, Mulva, but what you do see on the diagram is the Bartolin glands. And then also the anus is not part of the vulva, but you do see it on the, they do make the distinction on the drawing of where it is. So you've got the perineum and then the anus would be like down here. So the Bartolin glands are responsible for um, vaginal lubrication externally. So the Bartolin's glands secrete, um, during sexual response cycle, secrete um, the lubrication that helps make penetration um, safer and com more comfortable. Um, oh yeah, you also have the perineum there. So kind of, you've got here this this uh spot here and we'll give it a name in a little bit and then the perineum and then the anus would be like here so this is uh this is your vulva so everything on the outside including the clitoris um is the vulva 
And so let's talk more about what is the clitoris. So the entire clitoris is technically an external structure. It's its own thing. This is Dolores, um, our clitoris. The clitoris actually, this one has been just through the ringer. I've, I've had it for so long. And so the top is bent. It's actually supposed to be, have this more little like curve shape to it um, at the top. And the diagram shows it too. But I, I like generally having this one just because it's a little bigger. So uh, your clitoris has... Um, Kind of the way it sits is we're going to line it up with Mulva so you can kind of see what it looks like. If it was all exposed, it kind of sits like this. And so you've got the uh, exposed bit here. And then you've got uh, the, they're called like vestibules or like legs of the clitoris or crura is sometimes what they're called. Um, and uh, some people say like clitoral bulbs, but they're, they're actually called vestibular bulbs. And uh, they kind of go on either side of the vaginal opening, like down and they, they're behind the labia. So they're not exposed. Some people will say like internal, they're not internal structures. They're just hidden kind of the labia are in front of them. So the, the little nubby bit is exposed, but the rest of it is um, hidden, but it's technically all an external structure and it's all in front of the vaginal opening, um, but behind the labia. So there are 8,000 8, nerve endings in the clitoris. Um, so it's very sensitive. Um, that is why it feels so good to have it be touched. But because it is so sensitive, that's what the clitoral hood is for, is helping protect it from sensitivity. So some folks who like to have their clitoris touched prefer to have the touch come from the from over the clitoral hood instead of, or like even indirect stimulation where you're stimulating like from the sides and not from the top or not directly going straight in and touching the clitoris because it can be very, very painful to uh, touch a clitoris directly on. And so um, if you're uh, interacting with a partner who has a clitoris, like check in with them before it's not like a doorbell and you don't just want to like jam your fingers there. Like you want to make sure you're talking to them. Um, so there's some... Discussion here, like what about the G spot? So, because that's another thing that comes up. Um, so, what we know, what we've been calling the G spot for like a bunch of years, is uh, basically what you would do is you do, uh, you would insert like this and do like a come here motion toward that front wall of the vagina. And so here there's like a little spongy bit back here for a long time. We've been calling this the G spot. There's not actually like an anatomical structure that corresponds to the G spot. That's not like really an anatomical thing. Um, what is actually being stimulated is what's called the urethral sponge is back there. And then we talked about how the legs of the clitoris and the vestibular bulbs, of the clitoris, they're uh, behind the labia and in front of the vaginal entrance. And so when you stimulate that way, you're also from, from the inside stimulating the legs of the clitoris. And so, and so that, that stimulation feels really, really good. And so, and then people say like, oh, well, G-spot stimulation can produce ejaculation in a body that has a vagina. And um, sometimes people call it like female ejaculation. Um, but again, it's not inherently gendered. Anybody with a vagina can, um, might be able to do it. Uh, but and not everybody can, and that's okay. Um, but basically what happens is stimulation in that space can trigger, or any orgasmic stimulation, um, it doesn't just have to be there, can trigger a response from what's called the skein's gland, and the skein's gland is responsible for ejaculatory fluid in bodies with a vulva. So we'll talk more about that. Okay, so now let's move on to the penis. What you've got pictured there is, I hate that it says normal penis and circumcised penis, it's just an uncircumcised and a circumcised penis. I really need to find a better graphic for that. Uh, they're both normal. Um, so you've got a circumcised penis and an uncircumcised penis. And um, but I'll show you uh, basically a, the foreskin is analogous to the clitoral hood. And so we'll, you know, we talked about all being the same stuff, just organized differently. We're going to break that down. So, but basically what you've got is the, um, the glands of the penis, which is just like the head of the penis. So this would be like the, um, exposed part of the clitoris. And then you've got the, the frenulum is this a uh, bit right here. It's like a little vein under here. And then you've got what's called the rafe, which is the vein that runs all the way down. And so there are 4,000 nerve endings on the um, penis, 8,000 on the clitoris, remember 4,000 on the penis, a lot of them are concentrated in this space. So head of the penis and then running all the way down the rafe and in between the testicles. Um, 
And so not a lot of sensation coming from the spongy tissue on the sides, um, which is a lot of times why folks with a penis prefer more pressure contact um, rather than a lighter touch because they just, there's the nerve endings are sort of not as many and they're concentrated to a certain space where folks with a clitoris, they might prefer a lighter touch. But again, everybody's di- a little bit different. Okay. So this picture like kind of shows the similarities um, between the penis and the clitoris. Um, so remember, we're all made of the same parts. We're just arranged differently. I'm going to leave that there, but you guys can pause it and look at it longer if you want to. I'm going to go ahead and move forward. I'm going to break it down a little more. This is the prostate. Um, we talked about the skein's gland in a body with a vagina. So in a body with a penis, you have what's called the cowper's, you've got your prostate and your cowper's gland. Um, the prostate, to stimulate it, for pleasure, you have to go through the um, anus. And so you see the picture there where that's what's happening. That's also how prostate exams work. Um, So if you're going in for a prostate exam, somebody's going to put their finger in your bum. With the uh, internal stimulation for what we call like the G spot with like that zone of pleasure being stimulated, doing like a a upper hook motion. This is more like a lower hook motion. Um, And that's what that, and that's a, again, can be very pleasurable for a body with a penis. It can feel very, very, very good. Um, ex- feeling like that feeling pleasure, that being pleasurable is not the same thing as somebody being gay. So we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about sexual orientation and stuff, but like most bodies that have this anatomy, it's that stimulation can feel really pleasurable. So it's again, a very normal to enjoy that experience. And then the Cowper's gland is what's responsible for ejaculatory fluid in a body with a penis. This is going to break down that. So in the in the embryotic stage, everybody starts out um, what we sometimes hear is like a biologically female. So everybody starts like they're headed for a vulva. And then at some point in um, your developmental process, a switch gets flipped and you either develop a penis or you continue along your vulva clitoral track. The clitoral hood we talked about is homo- uh, homologous, sorry, to the foreskin. So we've we've talked about that. So the testes are homologous to the ovaries. So these are your test the these are testes. Um, as they develop, if those dr- the testes continue to develop a certain way, they get a bunch of testosterone in them. They will make sperm. They will not always, but sometimes drop out of the body into the scrotal sac, and that's what you get. Like testicles. That's what that is. Um, the same part in a body with a vagina is, has, is ovaries and they make eggs. Um, the skein's gland is homologous to the prostate and the cowper's gland. So we talked about this. They secrete a fluid that's part of the ejaculatory process. The frenulum and the forechet. Uh, so, um, I talked about the frenulum being here and that's like a little spot at the base of the glands. Now in a body with a vulva, It's called a forchette or forchette, and it's here at the base of the labia right before the perineum. So it is in a different spot, Um, but again, very sensitive tissue. So yeah, so that's the basic anatomy that we're all working with, and we can see how if you consider... I hate spectrum analogies because they're just not like nuanced enough, but if you consider these to be like two ends of a spectrum... And um, there, think about the wide variety of ways that these components could come together in between this and this and all the different ways they can look. Um, so yeah, it's, and again, a, sp- a spectrum is not really like the best analogy. Maybe next time I teach this, I'll come up with something better. So, okay, let's talk about, uh, that's our anatomy, physiology. Let's talk about desire. So some people call desire libido. Um, I'm going to be using desire and libido interchangeably. And we're going to then compare that to arousal. So um, your sexual response cycle and your desire for sex are separate mechanisms in your body. And that's going to be important. And we're going to talk about why. So desire, like AKA libido, um, basically like desire for sex can vary widely and can show up in a lot of different ways in people. Um, mismatched desire can feel really like if you're in a relationship with somebody or multiple somebodies and your libido doesn't sort of match up with theirs or your desire for sex, one of you wants a lot of sex and the other one, not so much that can be really frustrating for everybody involved. Um, and that can, again, where we lead to situations where can lead to situations where folks are 
feeling coerced into having sex or feeling like they have to coerce their partners into having sex. So uh, not understanding how desire and libido work um, can lead to a lot of confusion and frustration in relationships. Um, and poor libido, like not poor, like low libido um, can affect your sexual response cycle. So again, they're not the same component, but they do talk to each other. Um, arousal is your sexual response cycle. So that's the physiological. If desire is psychological, then arousal is physiological. So it's very closely linked, but not the same thing as desire. Um, people with low desire can definitely still experience arousal, even high arousal, even orgasmic arousal. People with high desire, high libido can struggle to experience or maintain all the different levels of their sexual response cycle or all the different phases of their sexual response cycle. So again, they're linked to each other, but they're not um, exactly the same thing and they can be mismatched um, even in your own body. Uh, so what triggers arousal? Like how, how does arousal start? I am operating on, so some of you have probably heard like the Masters and Johnson. And if you got like sex ed, in school, you probably got like the Masters and Johnson, like uh, it was like a it's the four phase model of sexual arousal, which is like initial arousal and then you plateau and then orgasm and then the refractory period. And uh, there's like a different model for male and female arousal. Um, and they're referring specifically to cisgender men and cisgender women. Um, but uh, we kind of understand Masters and Johnson did a lot of really awesome work to help us understand human sexuality. Um, but that's just what we've learned is actually just not the, the whole story and that that model just doesn't really fit how sexuality actually works for people. And it doesn't really explain the relationships between desire, like a desire for like it doesn't account for desire. So this is Basson's model of sexual motivation. So um, sexual motivation is the interaction between wanting sex and your body responding to that desire for sex. So, um, it sort of starts with the, um, we start with like the sexual motivation. Um, so you see that big star at the top, that's sexual motivation and emotional and physical satisfaction sort of feed into that. So I tell people everything you do outside the bedroom is foreplay. Everything you do inside the bedroom is sex. If you're in a relationship where you feel satisfied, um, if you're, and that's even with yourself. So even for like purposes of like solo sex and like masturbation, if you are emotionally and physically um, feeling satisfied, you will feel more motivated for sex. If you're having better sex, you'll feel more emotionally and physical, physically satisfied. Um, and again, these are like generalities, but those things contribute to each other. And so in Basson's model, we talk about how those things are interrelated. Um and so then the next kind of thing like by itself is like a willingness to be receptive for sex um, or like, you know, willingness to have sex. Like I'm in, I'm, I'm in, I want this um, sexual stimuli with appropriate context. So we're going to break all this stuff down. Context is a really big part of desire um, and that can be affected by arousability. So how easily is your body even aroused? Like, again, some folks are very quickly and easily aroused and some folks just takes a little longer. Um, and then you get actual arousal and then arousal and responsive desire. And we're going to talk more about res what responsive desire is. And then again, as that process kind of goes through, you get more emotional and physical satisfaction. And then that contributes back to sexual motivation. And so that diagram is really a responsive desire model. And then what you see kind of in the corner there is this big burst that says spontaneous desire and it's this loop of itself. And spontaneous desire is something different. So let's talk about like spontaneous versus responsive desire. Like what is that? First, let's understand um, the this is a nonlinear model on purpose. So the Masters and Johnson model was linear. It was linear and four phases. And then the idea was you got to the end of the phases and that was the end of sex. And then you would just start over at some other time. This um, is a nonlinear model on purpose because, again, it's just sort of it is a little bit more of a cycle. It is a little bit more of an ongoing process. And each process sort of contributes to and informs the other processes. <laughs> So understanding motivations for sex. So the model uses approach motivations and avoidance motivations. So an approach motivation focuses on something that is positive and an avoidance motivation is characterized by a desire to prevent or stop something. So 
an approach motivation might be, I really want to feel close to my partner, or I really, I, I like the endorphin boost from an orgasm, or um, I want to feel that pleasure. Like that's an approach motiva- motivation. An avoidance motivation might be, I don't want to hear my partner complain about how we never have sex anymore, or something like that. So uh, a characterized by a desire to stop something happening. And so, th- and both of those are reasons people might choose to have sex. You're kind of looking at both things. Uh, being mindful of, so Basson's model is mindful of sexual stimuli. So what people find sexually stimulating differs really widely. Um, so something that I think is a sexual cue and something that someone else thinks is a sexual cue are going to be different. What is happening? Um, initiates arousal when all other conditions are met. So, um, sexual cues in your environment will eventually trigger your sexual response cycle, but that's assuming that all the other conditions of context in this model are met. So just seeing something sexy isn't going to be enough. Context is a big part of it. Um, So yeah, context, physical and mental. This is definitely the most important of all the conditions in your sexual response cycle, like doing its thing. So that's the context of the sexual encounter and your state of mind. So if you have a person who is standing at the kitchen sink and they're washing dishes and their partner comes up behind them and starts to flirt with them and kiss their neck and like feel them up a little bit. That might be really arousing, but if the context is that they just had a nasty blowout fight and the partner hasn't apologized yet and the sex is their way of apologizing, that might not feel sexy. So um, your state of mind is going to be an issue. Also, like the, your physical surroundings are part of your context. So if I'm having sex in my bedroom, great, but if my bedroom is clean, that may feel differently to me than if my bedroom is really messy or disorderly or if I've got a pile of laundry I need to do. Or some folks, um, especially with quarantine, we're all like locked in our offices. If I work out of my bedroom and I all I can see is my desk or my phone is going off or something like that, context is going to kind of take me out of the moment. So context is like a really big thing um, in motivation, like do whether or not I want this. So it may not make a difference in whether or not my body responds to the sexual cues. Like I may still get aroused, but I may not want the sex. And we're going to talk about that distinction. Um, so ability to experience sexual arousal. Again, we talked about like everybody's ability to be aroused is different. And, uh, the sexual response cycle can be ignited during any phase of that model. So at any point, no matter how much a person does or doesn't actually want sex, like emotionally and mentally, your body can just be like, we're doing the thing because bodies are weird. A rewarding sexual experience, so sexual experience that is emotionally, physically, mentally rewarding, will lead a person to seek out more sex. On the flip side, a negative experience will decrease interest, and that's situationally and cross-situationally. So you might decide a negative experience with one person that happened, like if you have repeated negative experiences with one person, might make you decide, I don't want to have sex with that person anymore, but it might not turn you off from sex altogether. However, like experiencing a sexual trauma might turn you off from sex altogether for a while. And that would be really understandable. Um, So again, context, 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 context. Okay. So kind of the way it works is basically your body is always all the time scanning your environment for um, whether or not the cues in your environment are sexual cues. Um, You're not aware of this process. It happens in your brain. You're not like consciously aware of it, but it's always happening. And you've got two components. You've got your inhibition, sexual inhibition system and your sexual excitation system. So we're going to say your inhibition are the not cues and your excitation system are your hot cues. And your sexual tipping point is when the scales tip in one direction or the other. And so um, if I am in a room full of people and everybody in the room is really attractive to me and very good looking and there's lots of yummy smells in the room, those might be um, hot cues, excitation cues. Um, but if that room full of sexy, beautiful people is like a work function, that might be not cues, like not a good time for sex. Um, maybe it's really attractive, beautiful, wonderful people who I don't particularly like that, like as humans, maybe I don't think they're nice people, or maybe it's a job interview, or maybe, um, I don't know, all kinds of things. Maybe I'm at church. Uh, those are going to be not cues. And so the moment when the number of hot cues outweighs the number of not cues, that is usually when the that sexual tipping point is what kickstarts the physiological and organic processes 
um, behind your sexual response cycle. A little bit more about spontaneous and responsive desire. So spontaneous desire, sexual desire that feels like it just occurs out of the blue. So waking up, feeling horny, um, feeling like a desire for sex all the time. Totally normal and healthy. Culturally sanctioned is like the expected desire style. So we see a lot of examples in the media of people who are just really easily aroused, whose arousal is very easy to access, um, who take very little like foreplay. Context doesn't usually matter. They're just kind of ready to go all the time, having lots and lots of sex and always really like having a high desire for sex. That's like a very frequently modeled thing in the media. So that's what we kind of expect from people is spontaneous desire. It may include more frequent desire for sex, like multiple times per week. Um, sometimes for some folks, if the context is negative, it might feel like too much desire. So if you're with a partner who doesn't want to have sex, or if you're in a situation where you can't have a lot of sex, or um, if you have some other issues around sex that are causing you anguish and you're still having this like lots of desire. Um, so sometimes folks who have experienced sexual trauma, instead of feeling turned off from sex, they, without any explanation psychologically, feel a lot of desire to have sex. And maybe that's related to control or whatever. Like we could talk about that all day, but, um, I can feel really troubling for them. Like, oh, I just want to have it all the time. And I don't like physically, my body is just like ready to go all the time. I don't want that. So it, depending on the context, it's not always, Sometimes it's really awesome and sometimes it's not. Responsive desire, on the other hand, is sexual desire that emerges specifically in a context that is erotic. So again, erotic context can be different. For some folks, erotic context is uh, candles lit in a bubble bath and a glass of wine and chocolate covered strawberries and some bound chicken wow wow playing in the corner. And for some folks, erotic context is you came home and your partner cleaned up your kitchen and fed the kids and you have the night free to watch your own movie. And all of a sudden that's a turn on. So what we all consider erotic is different, but sexual desire needing that specific sexual cue or erotic context. Also totally normal and healthy. This is culturally sort of medicalized as what we call like low desire, maybe because it's a little bit less frequent than so like typically what we see is like cisgender men have more spontaneous desire and cisgender women have more responsive desire. And maybe because we just prioritize um, the male experience culturally or um, uh, that is why we look down on this is maybe we associate it with like femininity in some way. Um, I don't know. There's a lot of theory there. Uh, it may include more context sensitive desire. So preferring for things to be just right. Like I need to go take a shower first, or I really want to make sure I tidy up the table first, or I really want to make sure the kids are nowhere near the house or whatever. So preferring things to be just, just right, as opposed to like, let's dip into the bathroom for a quickie. It might feel like no desire in a context that has got a lot of not cues in it. So it may be really hard for people with responsive desire to overcome the, the not cues in their environment to access hot cues. Okay, so this kind of, again, this is unfortunately a lot of the research is just on um, the cisgender men and women's experience. Um, a lot of that's just related to hormones. So if you were a trans person experiencing medical transition in any way and hormones were involved, uh, you might be able to see how some of this is like a little bit reversed for you. If you're a non-binary person, then the sex that you were, um, I'm sorry, the gender that you were assigned at birth, you would want to maybe try to correspond it with that and see how this plays into it. And again, these are just generalities, but what we kind of see is that there is a 50% overlap between a cis man's what a cis man's genitals respond to as sexually relevant and what his brain responds to as sexually appealing so a thing my brain says i want and a thing my body says i want cis men about 50 percent of the time that like lines up Men's genitals are relatively general in what they respond to, and so are their brains. A stimulus can be sexually relevant, though, without being sexually appealing. So your brain, your body can say, yes, this is a sexually relevant cue, and your brain can be like, I, I don't want sex right now. Um, so cis women, there's only a 10% overlap between what a cis woman's genitals respond to as sexually relevant and what her brain responds to as sexually appealing. So women's genitals are relatively general on what they respond to. Their brains are a little more sensitive to context. And so what we're looking at is 
spontaneous versus responsive desire. So that mismatch when your brain says this is not sexually appealing, but your body says this is sexually relevant and your sexual response cycle kicks in anyway, that's called arousal non-concordance. Or your brain saying, I really, really feel like this is a very sexy thing and your body just like not responding at all. Also arousal non-concordance. The spot where that that like mismatch is called arousal non-concordance. <sighs> Um, and the reason arousal and concordance is an important understand, thing to understand, well, for lots of reasons. Sometimes uh, an argument against sexual assault will be, in a sexual assault case, will be, oh, well, clearly the person wanted it because, uh, you know, their penis got hard and or, you know, they got wet and or they haven't or they came, they had an orgasm. And so clearly that means they wanted it because if they didn't want it, their body would not have responded pleasurably. And that can be very confusing for the person who's experienced the trauma too. like, I didn't want it, but my body still was aroused. What the hell? This is like a totally normal thing that happens to lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of people um, in lots and lots and lots of occasions because our bodies are weird. And the th and there's a lot of reasons for that that would derail us like in a huge way. But just knowing that this is a thing and knowing it exists and knowing that it's normal is important because there's a lot of application for that information. OK, so uh, another thing we kind of keep going on the same train. Uh, we talk about sex being a drive. So is sex a drive? So that's a foundation for having a larger conversation. Is sex a drive? We talk about sometimes instead of libido uh, or desire, you hear a phrase sex drive. The person has a sex drive. So decide right now, true or false, do you think sex is a drive? All right, well, let's talk about what is a drive. A drive is a biological mechanism whose job it is to keep the organism at a healthy baseline, like a thermostat. So um, if my healthy baseline is telling me that I need more food to survive, I will get hungry. That drive to eat, hunger, that drive to eat causes me to consume food and that, that, that thermostat kicks in and says eat and then I eat and I go back to homeostasis. So when you think of drive, think survive. It's pushed by an unpleasant internal state and ends when you return to baseline. So I'm hungry until I eat. I eat and I'm at baseline and then I'm fine. And if I overeat and I go over the baseline, then I'm uncomfortable and unpleasant until I've processed some of that food and I've rested or done whatever to burn that off. Maybe gone to the bathroom, whatever it is. But once I get back to baseline, that unpleasant internal state ends. So based on that criteria, does sex fit? And the answer is no. <laughs> um, so sex is an incentive motivation system. So when you think of incentive, think of thrive. So drive is survive, incentive is thrive. So it's instead of being pushed by an unpleasant internal state, it's pulled by an attractive external stimulus. That's the incentive. And it ends when you've obtained the incentive. So it's want versus need. Um, need is drive. Want is incentive. It's thrive. It's something else. So sex is it's a want. It can be a very powerful want. It can be a, a want that becomes what sometimes people call a psychological drive, where you just feel so compelled that psychologically you feel very unpleasant until, you know, so it acts psychologically the way the drive acts physiologically, biologically, but it's not actually a biological drive. Like if you never had sex again, you would not die from that, even though sometimes it might feel like that. So why does it matter that sex is not a drive? So when sex is, when we conceptualize sex as hunger and then you rarely or never get hungry, there's something wrong with you. And we already know that's not true. We already know from all the things we just talked about that not having a, a lot of desire for sex or going a really long time without a desire for sex or some folks who never experience a big desire for sex, that's totally normal and fine and healthy. And there's nothing biologically or physically wrong with you just because you are not wanting a lot of sex right now. Like that inherently in and of itself is not a problem. But if you believe that there's something wrong with you, your stress response kicks in and stress can inhibit arousal in a big, big way. When your stress response kicks in, your interest in sex will completely evaporate. So if you already feel like it's an issue and you're feeling very stressed out about this issue, that stress is just going to make it worse. Also, if we treat sex like a drive, like hunger, then that means potential partners are like food. So when sex is conceptualized as a need, it creates an environment that fosters a sense of sexual entitlement. It reinforces this assumption, and a lot of times this is very gendered, that boy, again, because we talk about spontaneous versus responsive desire, and 
lots of cis men experience spontaneous and cis women experience responsive. And so there's a little bit of a mismatch there. And so uh, we have this idea that this so this cultural social message that boys require outlets to re relieve that sexual frustration. And we know there's science behind this, that men's sexual entitlement is one of the primary reasons that they sexually assault women. This idea, and again, because assault is it is a power, an issue of power, and um, it is an issue of control, um, and it, feeling entitled is a power issue. And so um, if we are treating, if we are sending this message that reinforces this idea of sexual entitlement, that is harmful to people. So we, we want to stop contributing to sex as a drive. Unfortunately, just like the G-spot is not really a thing, but I still didn't know how to teach it without using the phrase G-spot because that's just language people use so often you'll hear educators who know better say like sex drive because it's just such a part of the language um but just know that even if you're hearing sex drive it is not a drive it is not a thing you have to have to survive if your partner tells you you're gonna give me blue balls it tell them to go knock one out that's not your problem that's not a thing. No one's going to die from that. And if they try to convince you that it's going to cause physical damage to their body to not move through all the phases of their sexual response cycle, now you know better and they are going to be fine. They might feel a little unpleasant until they return to baseline, but they will be fine. So what kind of things inhibit libido and arousal? I'm going to go really quickly through this because it's a lot of information and this is already kind of going long. And the great part about this is you'll have these slides. You can pause it. You can take your time to review it later. So I'm just going to like drink from a fire hose on this one. So the kinds of things that inhibit uh, libido and arousal both, they, they, they impact both things. Uh, think about, again, things that Im impact uh, physiologically is going to be hormones, um, imbalance in hormones. Uh, so if you get pregnant or if you have fluctuating estrogen and testosterone throughout the month, throughout your year, um, throughout your life, uh, those things are going to impact because those are all part of your body's like mental process. Um, certain medications, natural effects of aging, weight loss, weight gain, um, hormonal medications, antidepressants, antihistamines. I tell people anything that like dries you up here is going to dry you up there. Um, severe and chronic medical conditions, also STDs, STIs, sexual health conditions, erectile dysfunction, vulvodynia, that kind of thing. Also sexual trauma and abuse. We also talked, we, we talked about like big life events, your sexuality is a whole part of who you are. So all of the things that you do all day, all the experiences you have, all the ways you move through life, that all informs the contexts that you find sexually appealing, the information that you find sexually appealing, the visuals that you find sexually appealing or not. And they all impact the physiology that it lets your sexual response cycle do its thing. It all plays together. So sexual trauma and abuse is another thing that impacts in a lot of extremes, libido and arousal. The biggest, biggest, biggest thing, stress and life changes. Like that category kind of encompasses a lot of what we already talked about, but stress is one of the biggest not cues ever. And things that cause people stress can make it very hard for your response cycle to do its thing. A lot of times we talk about improving. So I say improving, if somebody has... If their experience of their libido or their experience of their arousal is not where they want it to be, if they're like, oh man, I really want a lot of sex, but my body's just not responding. Or if they're like, man, I really wish I wanted sex more. You know, I think it'd be really great. I, I don't hate the idea of sex, but man, my body just, my brain just never wants it. And I'd like to maybe work on that. It's easier to and quicker. It's a quicker fix to work on issues of arousal. Because again, remember we talked about your body will respond to lots of things, whether your brain is on board or not. And so if you make the decision to kickstart your arousal process, even if your brain is like, I don't know if I want this, think about it like you have fitness goals and you really know that getting to the gym is part of that. And maybe you actually don't want to get off your couch and go to the gym. But once you get there, you're glad you did. This is kind of like that. So we're not talking about issues where there's no consent. We're talking about issues where your like libido just hasn't caught up to like you want you want more than what your libido is responding to. So foreplay games, communication tools, sex toys are lots of ways to kickstart arousal, lubricant. There's also medical interventions. We're not really going to talk about them, but hormone replacement therapy, arousal medication, that kind of thing. Again, I, I'm not a doctor, so I don't really spend a lot of time talking about that. Um, 
improving lib that's arousal. So it's very easy to treat that much more quickly. But if your issue is libido based, remember all those things we just talked about that have impact libido, all the not that's, I can add more hot cues. I can add foreplay and lubricant and toys, but taking away not cues, maybe it's as quick as folding your laundry. So you don't have to look at the pile of laundry in the corner, or maybe it's a more comprehensive thing, like working with your doctor to adjust the medication that you're on. So that is not inhibiting it so much. So that can be a, a longer story that involves more, um, a little bit more involved than just like grabbing a Hitachi magic wand and, um, and kind of going to town. So foreplay, uh, I tell people the most their most important sex organ is um, your brain. In terms of consent, I cannot say yes to something if I don't know what I do and don't like. Uh, so again, informed consent is about discovering what turns you on. Dis informed consent is about discovering what you do and don't like. Informed consent is about being able to say to a partner, oh, you know what? I thought I was going to like that and it turns out I don't. And a lot of that happens in the brain. And so um, discovering what turns you on, having good communication, creating romantic and erotic contexts for yourself. Again, what that looks like is different from person to person, but that happens in the brain. Your largest sex organ is your skin. So touch can be deeply sexy without ever involving penetration or genitals. And so when we talk about people defining sex in their own way, it's not always just two genitals two sets of genitals mashing. In fact, a lot of times it doesn't have to be that at all and can still be a very rewarding sexual experience. Um, and so thinking about touch differently. And again, that can also be, um, consent can be a negotiation where we're saying like, hey, I actually don't want to do that particular activity because we talked about it being specific moment to moment. I don't know if I want to do that activity, but I do want to maybe talk about, can we try something different instead? Can we do this other thing? And so if our definitions of what is sexy and what is sex are broader, we have more options when we're with a person we care about and we're in a situation where we maybe want to do the thing or want to try to do the thing, but we need a little more on the menu, right? Four play activities, sensual leading to sexual. So engaging all five senses, remembering that emotional satisfaction is a big part of it. And again, that thing that I said that everything you do outside your part for your partner outside the bedroom is foreplay. And I say outside the bedroom, just outside of that sexual context. And then inside that sexual context, that's all sex. This is really, really foreplay is a primary component of the consent negotiation process. Foreplay is all the stuff that goes into negotiating consent with each other. And I don't mean negotiation like coercion. I mean like figuring out what everybody's a yes and a no to. All right. So I talked about lubricant also being an important part of like foreplay and an important part of um, a resource for kickstarting arousal and that kind of thing. Um, it's also an important part of safer sex. So let's talk about it. Lubricant can definitely stimulate desire. Remember I talked about uh, the way that the body works. Uh, when your sexual response cycle does eventually kick in, the physiological responses are that your brain tells your body like, all right, it's go time for whatever reason. And then your body like sends blood to all the relevant areas that typically are part of the sexual process. So nipples get hard, chest gets flushed, pupils dilate, blood rushes to the genitals, um, genitals start to get wet. Um, and so lubricant, that wetness is part of the physiological arousal process. And so if you're in a situation where you're physiology is maybe not doing your body's just not like responding you're experiencing that arousal non-concordance adding lubricant can um kind of trick your brain into like oh wait like there's wetness there let's do the thing and it feels really good um because it does mimic a physiological sign of arousal it also can reduce pain and discomfort so some folks again we talked about the things that affect your libido and arousal uh you know things that dry and things that dry you up here, drying you up in other places, um, that can be painful. So lubricant can help reduce that pain. T different types of sex, different positions, if they're not properly lubricated, can feel um, a little bit discomfort, uncomfortable. Now, if you're using lubricant and you're still having pain during sex, or if you're feeling pain during sex in ways that you didn't feel it before, like if it's new, t talk to your doctor, there could be something else going on. But in terms of just like minor discomforts, um, lubricant can be a big part of try a lube, see if it helps. 
they can enhance sensation. So a really good lube that doesn't have a ton of other additives in it can actually enhance the sensations you're experiencing. Some lubes are really good as acting, at acting as a barrier to keep bacteria out. So anything you're bringing into your body is carrying with it anything that's already on it from the outside world. And so unless you are actively perfectly sanitizing, I mean, we clean our toys or our hands or our bodies. Usually we do a good job like washing up before we have sex. Like that's fine. But most people are not like perfectly sanitized before they engage in some kind of sexual activity, whether that's masturbation or sexual partner. And um, so all the germies on your hands, all the germies on your toys, all the germies on the mouths involved, all those things come into your body with whatever body part or toy or whatever that's also coming in. And so lube can sort of act as a barrier, uh, just like the same way that your body's membranes act as a barrier to help keep those things out. Lube can enhance that process and help keep things a little cleaner. Obviously, lube is there to reduce dryness, but even people who are not chronically dry, there's all these other benefits to using lube. It can improve the function of your condoms. So if a condom dries out, it can tear. Um, and so using lube in conjunction with condoms, but having remembering which lubes go are compatible with which condoms. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and also just improving safer sex outcomes. It reduces skin irritation and tearing. And so those little microscopic tears that can happen when skin is too dry, that can be a breeding ground for yeast, mold, bacteria, STIs. And so lube can help reduce that. Uh, so there's main, our lube kind of consists, uh, exists in some main categories. And I like to spend time talking about lube because it is something that most people, if they did get sex ed, didn't get this. And so a lot of people are guessing in the lube department and um, lube can impact, um, it ha has such a, a potential to impact your health and wellness in good or bad ways. So I think it's important education. So main categories of lube, you're going to get water-based. Um, so that's good for most activities and it's compatible with all your barrier methods. So all your condoms, all of it, water-based is good to go. It's also compatible with all your toys. So water-based is great. Some water bases can cause irritation because there's such a wide variety of additives in water-based lube. Um, water-based is the most widely available lube. So when you go to the store and you pick up a lube off the grocery store shelf or the um, drugstore shelf, it's almost always going to be a water-based lube. Um, also like the playful lubes that are warming, flavored, creamy, tingly, like usually those are water-based. And because of the wide variety and lack of regulation on lube, a lot of folks, if you are if you have a lube that's causing irritation, it's almost certainly a water-based lube and it's got a ton of additives in it. So you just want to check for something with low additives. Uh, your next category is silicone lube. So silicone lube is good for water-based activities like shower sex um, or like sex in the hot tub or whatever. Silicone is going to be great for that because water will wash off a water-based lube. Also good for anal sex. Uh, water-based lube for penetration of a vagina. The vagina self-lubricates also. Even if vagina, even vaginas that are having some issues with self-lubrication still will self-lubricate more than people realize. And that vaginal lubrication works well with a water-based lube to make things even wetter. Again, you don't want to go down a water slide that doesn't have any water. Like that helps. But a healthy anus doesn't self-lubricate. And so it doesn't have that lubrication to help kick in to help the lube along and work well with the lube. And so if you're using a water-based lube for anal sex, what you'll find out is that you're using a lot of lube and um, the experience may be less than desirable, where a silicone, um, silicone molecules are too big to be absorbed by your skin. So they stay on the surface of your skin longer. And so they're really great for anal sex um, because uh, you don't have to use as much and it feels better longer. And again, reduces, talk about reducing like skin irritation, tear, micro tears, that kind of thing. And so it's also safer and reduces discomfort. They're great for folks who are irritated by other types of lube because uh, pure silicone lube with no additives is hypoallergenic. Um, so people say, oh, I'm allergic to silicone. No, you're not. And if you're feeling like silicone is irritating you, again, check for additives because it's very unlikely to, that it's the silicone lube that's doing it. I mean, it might be. I'm not going to argue with your um, experience. You know your body and you know what you like. But it's possible that if it, the lube is irritating you, that it's some other additive in there. Um, so if you're like, I really want to use silicone lube, like check the additives. Uh, silicone lubes are compatible with all barrier methods. So some people say, oh, you can't use silicone lube with condoms. Yes, you can. A condom that's lubricated, that comes pre-lubricated is lubricated with silicone. 
You don't want to combine silicone lube with silicone toys. There are some exceptions to that, but they're sort of outside the scope of what we have time for. So just think of it as a good rule of thumb that you don't combine silicone with silicone. And if you're interested in more information on lube, I'll put a link to our lube video because we have a really cool video on lube. Our next category is oil-based lube. So folks who use coconut oil as lube or use it as a base for lube, almond, shea, I encourage folks who have a vagina not to put coconut oil in it because it can just promote yeast infections. Any kind of oil-based lube can be really problematic for somebody with a vagina. I'm not your mom. Lots of people like coconut oil lube. I'm not going to come and like with the the lube police and get in your face about it. I'm just going to tell you what I recommend as a pro that I'm not ever going to tell a, a person with a vagina who's having issues around lube, I probably would never suggest an oil-based lube for them. But that doesn't mean that lots of people don't enjoy it. It, I would say don't use food products. So you want to use coconut oil specifically does have a lot of um, antibacterial uh, qualities. So of all the oil bases, if you're just using a straight like coconut oil, that's probably fine. I would go for something that's made for lubricant, made to be a lubricant because they're taking into account body safety usually. Um, but these are great for masturbation for penis havers and to go along with masturbatory toys for penis havers. So like the sleeves that penis havers use to masturbate. Oil-based lubes are great for that. Um, they can be irritating to vaginas and butts. They're not safe for latex condoms and they can't promote yeast and bacteria. So then you've got hybrids. So that's some combination of the above. They're still really new. There's fewer clinical trials on them. So I just tell people, swim at your own risk. Try it. If it doesn't work out for you, it's not going to do permanent damage. So just stop using it if you don't like it. If you're interested in trying a lube that is a hybrid lube, you can usually ask the company that makes it to send you samples. Things to avoid. Desensitizing products designed to numb pain. A lot of these are... Um, for uh created for like anal sex specifically you'll see products called like anal ease and pain is your body's way of telling you something's up so again we talk about ability to give consent if a person has numbed their ability to feel pain whether that's too much alcohol or a product designed to numb pain if they have um or like the products that numb your throat so you can they numb your gag reflex numb your throat so that you can uh give blowjobs deeper than you might normally those products can be really dangerous. You can do damage to your body because your body doesn't have a pain response telling you when to withdraw your consent. Like, oh, that's too much. No, like slow down, whatever. Like those those are consent phrases. Don't do that. Don't do that. Like, ah, let's stop. That's because your body's telling you you need more foreplay or you need more lube or you don't like that activity or whatever. And so um, I encourage people not to use products to numb pain. I use I encourage people if you really want to learn how to do a product, uh, do a behavior that is painful and you want to learn non painful ways to do it. Talk to an educator, get education around that behavior, but avoid desensitizing products. Another thing we talked about avoiding using food products as lube. Um, also, Using something that's not intended to be a genital lubricant as lube. Um, and those are also things I would just tell people like, so uh, don't use hand lotion, don't use Vaseline, um, it, hair conditioner, like none of that is designed to be lube and it's going to very likely cause you like problems and infections and you want to keep your water slide open as long as possible, right? So let's talk about sexual risk awareness. Um, I like to frame this for people in like first just defining what risk is. Um, so like thinking about what kinds of risks you face just when you leave the house every day. And I don't know that I'm going to answer that for you, but just like considering what you just to get up out the door to get to where you leave the house. I mean, right now our risks are different, right? That can change. Cont context can change what we consider risky. So uh, a decision to leave the house here in the time of coronavirus um, might be a very different decision than to leave the house, um, you know, six months ago. And if we're six months into the future, a year into the future, that's going to look very different, right? So if you're watching this later, and you know, you're seeing me record during coronavirus quarantine, and maybe later when we're out of quarantine, risk is going to look different then. So thinking about risk and context and how people do and don't assess risk. So if I'm here in the time of Corona, and I want to leave my house to go to the grocery store, 
you know, I have to think about things like the kinds of risks I have to think about are like, do I wear a mask and what do I know about mask safety and how do I know if the mask I'm using is a good mask and will it protect me or protect other people? Do I want to use gloves? Do I understand glove safety? And do I understand that I need to change my gloves every time I start a new activity? Am I going out just for essentials or do I feel like I can go out all the time? Am I in a country where, or in a part of the country where leaving the house and being in gatherings they will fine you or maybe ticket you. Or am I in a space where it's kind of at your own risk? Is it riskier for me because more people might be out if there are less legal enforcements around it? So all of the things we do to process risk and then we make decisions. We get all the information, so informed consent, right? I get, I get all the information and then I say, okay, with that information, I'm going to make the decision I'm going to make. Again, unless it's like a legally enforceable thing for the most part. And I could maybe know I'm breaking the law by going to this gathering because right now there's laws around it. Well, at least I knew to make that decision. Now, if I didn't know the law was there and I'm still getting in trouble, I didn't have the information I needed. And now I'm in a bad situation. Right. So. So again, we talk about what information we need to create a plan for managing our risk, right? So we just talked about all that information. Risk specific to you, right? So what is risky for me right now versus what is risky for like my mom who has a compromised immune system. Our levels of risk are very different. I am considered an essential worker because I'm uh, running the 24 hour, not running. I'm one of the people that's responsible for our 24 hour rape crisis hotline. And so I might have to leave my house. And so my risk profile is a little bit different than like my children never have to leave the house, but their risk profile is different than people who live in a house where none of the parents ever have to leave. Um, so how do you determine, like what information do you need to determine when something is too risky versus worth the risk? And again, that's going to be different for everybody. And then what happens if, despite all your planning, you still encounter adverse consequences? So you do everything right, you still get coronavirus. You do everything right, and uh, you still end up, you know, you, you're a great driver. You never text. You always wear your seatbelt. You're very safe and you still get in a car accident. You know, what happens then? So, D and, so risk awareness is learning what you need to know to make a decision about what your risk profile looks like. And then also having a game plan for not just mitigating the risk, but managing risks when you, when you encounter them. So sexual risk awareness specifically, just like risk is part of life, risk is also a natural part of having sex. Like you're having sex, sex is risky. It just is. There's, uh, humans are very bad at assessing risk. And because we inundate sex education with risk messaging, people do overestimate usually how risky sex is um, or the types of behaviors that are risky but it is still it's there is risk just like uh, being around people you, you could get a cold from them having sex with people there are risks so you think about what are the risks of having sex there's um, physical risks you know getting sick maybe we talked about um, the physical risk of using a lube that's wrong and then I have a bacteria infection or the physical risk of trying a new thing in bed and somebody hurts themselves a little bit or whatever. So physical risk, what are the physical risks involved or bigger physical risks um, of, you know, people being unkind. We talk about sexual assault and those kinds of things, you know, and if somebody assaults you, it's not your fault. There is no amount of risk management that would ever make it your fault and not someone else's. But when we're talking about determining your level of risk, we're just talking about all the things that you consider and they range from very minor to very big mental and emotional risks. So if you're the type of person that knows that you get really attached to somebody when you have sex with them, um, you might not want to have sex with somebody that would be a bummer to get attached to. If you're the type of person that does not like to have sex with any strings attached and you're just like, nope, I want easy, casual, easy, breezy, beautiful cover girl, whatever. You might not want to have sex with somebody who really likes to get attached. So those, that's just one example. And then social risks, right? We talk about stigma around sexual behavior. We talk about maybe the risk is the person I'm having sex with. I wouldn't want anybody to find out about them because it might out me or because I wouldn't want, maybe I don't want my parents to know I'm, I'm in my thirties. And still sometimes I'm like, I don't know if I want anybody to know that about me. So, um, also social risks, like depending on where you're at in the country or depending what kind of friend groups you're in, the social messaging around sex can can determine how people receive information about your sex life. And so some people are in spaces where they can be very open 
about their sex life and some people are in spaces where they can't be and that's all part of your risk profile um and then just other risks so again giving thought to like what that looks like so what information do you need to make informed decisions about your sexual risks and that's going to be different for all of us so I'm going to talk, when I talk about sexual risk, I'm kind of going to leave the, a lot of the relationship stuff out of it again for time. Um, we're going to talk about things that uh, like our public health risks, and we're actually not going to talk about pregnancy. So we're going to specifically talk about like STIs, HIV, that kind of thing. Um, so there's kind of two components to mitigating risk. There's the ways that you mitigate risk on your own. So, you know, the things that you can be empowered to do to mitigate your risk. And then there's mitigating risk with your partner. So some of this is about information your partner can provide you and communications you have with them. And again, sometimes no matter how diligent you are and no matter how much you're acting in good faith, you're with a partner who isn't and you're not responsible for that. If a person is lying to you or not giving you the full picture or takes advantage of you or violates your consent, like, like that person that's on them, that's not on you. It's not your fault that that happened. And so when I talk about mitigating risk on your own, I never want to send a, a message that says, Oh, if you become a victim of somebody who takes advantage of that, that that was your fault or that you didn't do enough to mat to mitigate your risk. Like, no, absolutely not. That's not the case. What I do want to do is give you information to help you feel empowered to identify the areas where you want to take control over, over things so that you can be as sexually safe as you want to be. Um, so mitigating risk on your own, that's your own sense of education, education, your own access to testing and healthcare. With your partner, it's communication about STI status, barrier use, testing results, maybe other people you're sleeping with. Um, if you're engaging in certain behaviors that are new to you, you want to talk to your partner about how experienced they are with those behaviors, that kind of thing. So education and knowledge is power. Uh, specifically in regards to STDs, most practitioners are not going to test you for everything. Um, so if you go in and you say, I want STD tests, and that's kind of all you say, or STI um, STI test just stands for sexually transmitted infection. And you go to your general practitioner and they say, okay. And they send you to the lab to get some blood work and give you a cup to pee in. And then they say, we'll call you if anything's positive. And if you don't hear from us, just assume that everything's negative and you're okay. And that's kind of it. And then most people think, oh, well, I got tested. And then they don't actually know what they got tested for. Um, so let's talk about what that might look like. Uh, the most commonly offered test. So if I went into a doctor and I had that conversation, I probably definitely got tested for chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, and sometimes HIV. And that's going to vary from state to state. But you have to opt, especially here in Florida, you have to uh, opt out of HIV testing in some situations and opt in in others. And so you're usually aware if you're being tested for HIV, but chlamydia, syphilis, gonorrhea, you might think you're also being tested for other things, but unless they specify that you are, don't assume. So tests that usually not always have to be specifically requested are going to be um, herpes and HPV, human papillomavirus and hep C. So the thing about herpes and HPV is they are very difficult if not impossible to test for. And uh, like in most cases, you're testing for like antibodies of things, not actual presence of things. Um, and so it's very, very hard. And there's not, good, especially HPV, there's not good testing for HPV. Again, the details of this are a little outside the scope of our limited talk, but I at least wanted to give you access to like, what information is involved here. So if you wanted to continue to educate yourself, you would at least know, have a starting point. But they can be very difficult to test for. And estimates are that sexually active folks over the age of 16 have these things. Um, HPV and HSV are so, so, so common in like upwards of 80% of folks, um, maybe more. It's very hard to estimate because again, very hard to test for. They're also largely asymptomatic. So there are times where they can be spread and folks don't know they have them or that they're spreading them. So there's a lot involved and it, it's expensive to test for them and can be kind of expensive to treat um, some of them. And so unless you're asking for a test and usually folks don't ask unless they're symptomatic, it's hard to get that information. It's not impossible. It's just not something that's a default. You have to have that conversation specifically with your doctor where your doctor will provide you the information you need to make a, a decision about testing. Hep C is another one that's in the list of STIs, but it's most commonly transmitted through uh, intravenous drug use and like sharing needles. And so it doesn't mean you can't get it from sex because you totally can, but that's just not the most common way people get it. So unless you've said that you are at risk for hep C or you've asked to be tested for hep C, you're not going to get that test. STIs that are usually treated specific to the symptom is going to be like pubic lice, so crabs, scabies, trichomoniasis, genital warts. 
not all STIs are curable, but many of them are. But all STIs and HIV are extremely treatable. Successful treatment um, is exponentially improved by early detection. So the sooner we're testing, the better treatment goes. Often an STI will not produce symptoms, and so it makes frequent testing a lot more important for that early treatment and detection. You can see links where I've got um, references all throughout the slides to a lot of this information if you want to learn more. Testing in healthcare. What keeps people from getting tested? How often should you get tested? So what keeps people from getting tested? Stigma, mostly. Stigma or just unaware. Like I'm not aware that I needed to be tested or I'm afraid of like people will think I'm dirty if I go to get tested or I don't know how to ask or I'm on my parents' insurance. I don't want them to see it. So it's usually fear and stigma that keeps people or they don't don't know where to get tested. So depending on where you're at, maybe you don't have access to it or you don't know that you have access to it. How often should you get tested? That's going to depend. It's going to depend on how often you're having unprotected sex. And there, are, we're going to talk about what protection means because it means lots of things. But how often you're having sex that's not protected or the types of unprotected sex you're having. Sex with a partner who you know has an STI obviously is going to change your risk profile than if your partner either doesn't know they have it or knows they don't have it, right? So there's a person who knows they have an STI. There's a person who does not know because they haven't been tested. And so they're not, they're maybe not symptomatic, but they just don't know for sure. And then there's people who know, oh, I don't have this because I got tested and I haven't had sex and blah, blah, blah. Um, so that's going to make a difference. Sexual non-monogamy can determine, help determine sexual frequency. So it's not true that monogamy means you won't get STD like people who think they're in monogamous relationships can still get STDs can still get HIV because sometimes our partners don't tell us the truth about their behavior. Um, so again, that's not your fault if that happens um, at all. And you're not to blame if that happens. But I encourage even monogamous folks to get tested once a year just as part of their regular health screening process. And, uh, you know, you go in for your yearly physical, you go in for everything else, just go ahead and do the STD testing too. Even if you completely, totally trust your partner, it's, there's no harm in getting the tests done. Um, on the flip side, just because someone is sexually non-monogamous, that does not mean that they're necessarily at a higher risk or that they're, I'm sorry, it doesn't mean that they're more likely to get STIs. They are exposing themselves more often, so their risk profile looks different. But if they're being honest with their partners about their non-monogamy and if they're using, if they're protecting themselves in whatever ways are important and necessary to them and they're getting frequent testing, they may actually be a lower risk than somebody who was thought they were monogamous, was having un unprotected sex, and then is actually cheating and lying to their partner and not using protection. So uh, monogamy by itself is not a, a thing, but monogamy does change your risk profile. So, and then incidents of sexual assault. So again, if somebody takes away your ability to consent or takes your power from you, that will change, that can determine t testing frequency. So some folks, depending on uh, the nature of the assault, part of their process during their forensic exam or during the medical process uh, after the assault might include um, testing. So there's a full, I've got uh, websites here for screening record screening recommendations. Also, if you go to gettested.cdc.gov, you can put in your zip code and it'll tell you where you can get tested near you and different types of testing, free and reduced pricing. So we're talking about barriers a little bit. So your most common non-medicinal barriers are going to be condoms, gloves, dental dams, and um, internal condoms. So let's do like a real quick little, what is that? So quickly, let's look at external condoms. I'm going to show you how to properly put on an external condom just because some folks have never seen this happen. They're not, and that this is really helpful to them. So we'll be quick, but I want to show this to you. So um, you check the expiration date. I know that this one is not expired, but check your expiration dates. Also check the package to make sure that it is got no holes in it. And you want to push the condom over to the side a little bit so you don't accidentally tear it. And you want to use the guide. Every condom packet has a little slit in it to help you tear it open. And what you're going to do is Remove the condom from the package and you're going to see this little like it looks like a little kind of a little beanie hat or whatever, like a little like, kind of nipple sticking up. You want to pinch the tip of the condom and you want to with just two fingers, you want to roll, unroll the condom all the way down. Sorry, until it reaches the base of the penis. And you just want to do the two fingers. I should have started with my right hand. And the reason you want to pinch the tip is ejaculatory fluid 
um, fills up that reservoir tip and keeps the condom from bursting. If the condom is very tight to the head of the penis, then the ejaculatory fluid has nowhere to go. And so, and you use two fingers instead of a whole fist because if it's a lubricated condom, two fingers keeps you from like manhandling all the lube off. Plus you want to handle the condom with your hands the least amount possible. Okay. So now internal condom. So this is an O cube. This is our internal condom. Uh, they used to be called female condoms, but we're changing the name to internal condom. One, because you can use these. It's an off-label use, but you can use these for anal sex. I'm going to show you how to use them for vaginal sex, um, but uh, I'll um, maybe do another longer video where we talk about other uses for them. Um, but we know that, again, that vaginas are not inherently female, so we're calling these internal condoms, and they're changing the packaging. But it comes out of the package the same way an external condom does, and it looks uh, kind of funky the first time. If you've never seen one before, it can look a little weird. Um, but these are actually really cool. These are made of nitrile, not latex, which means they're compatible with a lot more types of lube. They have um, like a ring in them. It's called a, it's like a little Nuva ring kind of deal. Um, it's just a flexi ring. And what it does is go, so if this is your, if this is a vagina, this is the vulva, this is the vaginal opening. And then back here would be like where the cervix is. And so you've got the vagina here. You squeeze the ring and you help. The ring is like a guide and you use your fingers to get the ring all the way in and it anchors against the back wall where the cervix is. And then penetration happens like this. So penetration happens and you do not double condoms up. So if you're using an external condom, you don't use this. If you use an internal condom, you don't use the external condom. Um, this provides a lot more external protection to the vulva than the external condom does. Also, just uh, as a fun fact for folks who like this information, the ring of an internal condom will stimulate the clitoris during um, certain sexual behaviors. So that can be really pleasurable. Also, you can put an internal condom in like six or eight hours before you use it. So you can put it in before dinner and have it be there ready to go. And then Voila, there you go. You're ready to go. You already have your condom. You already have your protection. Um, so if you're with a partner who doesn't like to wear external condoms or hasn't found an external condom that fits right, or some folks like to use these for period sex, there's lots of applications for these. I say, you know, you can usually get them uh, at your health department, at places that do STI testing. Um, I've been stashed in some of the women's centers, so your local need those. If you're on campus, usually your campus um, clinics have them. Um, if you have an LGBT center at your campus, a lot of times they carry them. So there's lots of places to get them, or you can go to fc2.com and get them there. I say practice with one before you're with a partner, because just like with an external condom, once you figure out how to use it, it's fine. All right, so our next barrier method, non-medicinal barrier method, is a dental dam. So they come in a package like this. Basically what it is, is just a sheet of, these are latex. You can also get non-latex ones. It goes over a vulva or an anus, and the purpose is protection for oral sex. So this OQ is already a little bit lubricated, and as you can see, it's kind of clinging to it. Lubrication really helps the use of these. Um, and like these ones are flavored. You can get them flavored and non-flavored, but this is now a barrier for protection for um, oral sex specifically. They're called dental dams because they uh, first had use in dental offices and uh, some dentists still use them. And so uh, that's why they have the name. You can also make dental dams out of like plastic wrap, like saran wrap. So you could do that. You can also um, cut a condom into a dental dam, but um, I don't have a ton of time. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do another video on these and make them a little longer. So that's a dental dam. And then our last one is gloves. So gloves are a great barrier. You can get latex, nitrile, or vinyl gloves. They're an excellent barrier method for um, manual sex. Uh, so hand jobs, mutual masturbation, that kind of thing. Uh, your fingernails are like real dirty underneath, especially if you have like a longer, like a manicure. Some people will put um, cotton over the edge of their fingernails and then put the gloves on so that they don't um, cut people. But fingernails can be dirty. So unless you carry in, like putting gloves in your safer sex kit and having them with you um, can help depending on the types of sex you're having. But you want to like if I'm using gloves for digital uh, anal penetration, I don't want to then go straight to like a vagina. I want to just like I would switch condoms between acts. I also want to switch gloves 
and use a new glove each time I do things. Like you see people now during Corona and they put their gloves on to go to the grocery store and then they use the same gloves to pump gas in their car and then they use the same gloves to go to a different store later and they just, that's not, no, you gotta change gloves every time they're, or they're not effective. I can adjust my gloves to make a dental dam. So if I cut the fingers off and then I cut down the blade of the glove, like the, the side of the glove, not the thumb, but the side away from the thumb. So this side of the glove, cut it open. And now I have this, and this is a great, this can work as a dental dam, or depending on the size of the penis, uh, especially like because you can get gloves in so many different sizes and you can get them in some really stretchy textures. This can also be a really great um, condom option and have extra um, uh, texture for protection um, for folks who need a smaller size condom than what's available on the shelves. So gloves are a really cool part of safer sex kits that a lot of people don't consider. Medicinal barrier methods are going to be vaccinations for hepatitis A and hepatitis B are available. You can also get a vaccination for HPV. So if you haven't gone and got your Gardasil vaccination and you are under, I think they've upped the age to like 45, um, you can go get vaccinated for HPV. Uh, some strains of HPV cause cancer. So uh, if you haven't done it I and you have access to medical care, go do the thing. Also, PrEP and PEP. So PrEP is a pill that you take once a day to prevent HIV. It's like a birth control pill, but for HIV, you take it once a day to prevent HIV and it's highly effective. PEP, it stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis. It doesn't prevent against other STIs, but it does prevent against HIV. So you'd still have to wear condoms to prevent other STIs, but awesome, right? PEP is post-exposure prophylaxis. So if you think you've been exposed to HIV or if you um, maybe you've been sexually assaulted and you're not sure um, and you think that that's a risk, uh, you can be prescribed PEP and that will um, that's, that's treatment for HIV to keep you from, you've been exposed, but to keep you from contracting HIV. Treatment as prevention is another like medicinal, um, I don't know if barrier method is the right word, but a, a medicinal way to help prevent the spread of STIs. So again, we talk about early detection and treatment. If I know I have an STI, getting tested and getting treated for it before I continue to have um, unprotected sex or before I continue to have sex, uh, penetrative sex, sex that exposes people to that STI. So whatever it is, you would just adjust your risk profile accordingly. That doesn't mean you can't do anything sexy with people. It just means that you want to... Um, take that into account while you're in treatment. And so using treatment as prevention to keep STIs from spreading. Condom and consent negotiation. So negotiating condom use is really important. And just how do you negotiate it? We don't want to make assumptions that everybody's on the same page about using condoms. We want to make sure we're having conversations with our partner about, you know, are they expecting to use condoms? How do I feel about using condoms? If we don't want to assume our partner's okay with us just not using condoms. You don't want to make assumptions about that. So um, also thinking about maybe, again, what what are some common objections to condoms? So if you're watching this for class, maybe that could be a good discussion question for you guys, like common objections to condom use. One of the biggest objections is it just doesn't feel right or I just don't like it. I think it feels better without it. It might feel different without it, but not necessarily better. So if you're having an issue with the way that feels to wear, especially an external condom, condom fit might be an an issue. So you go to myonecondoms.com and they have 60 different custom sizes of condom. I will also link uh, to a video that I've created about condom fit where you can learn more about that if you want to. Um, I specifically want to talk about stealthing. So stealthing is removing or damaging a condom without telling your partner. And this is a weird phenomenon that occurs and it does occur with alarming frequency. It is illegal. It is stealthing is illegal. Stealthing takes away the consent of the other person. Stealthing is rape. So if you have agreed to have sex and the conditions that you have agreed on are that condoms are part of the deal and then you stop using condoms or you take the condom off or you damage the condom or you know the condom is damaged and you don't tell your partner and you keep having sex anyway, you have violated their consent. That is stealthing is not consent. Stealthing is rape. 
All right. So that's, uh, that's our whole talk. I really appreciate you guys hanging in there. I know this is like a little bit longer, but again, I just want to provide like foundational stuff. If you have questions about the Women's Center of Jacksonville, you can go to womenscenterofjax.org. If you are in need of assistance and would like to access the 24 hour rape crisis hotline, it's 904-721-7273. Um, if you have questions about this for me, Email me. I've got my email there. Um, this is my non-professor sex email and my non-women center email. Uh, I just want to make sure I get your email and school accounts sometimes block the professor sex account. Um, if you're at UNF and you try to look up professor sex from a school computer, it will give you a warning that it is a sex education website. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and I don't know how the other universities handle it, but I know that it's not always accessible to everybody. The email address that I know will work for everyone is angel K Russell at outlook.com. And we'll make sure there's a link to that. And so if you guys have questions, please feel free to shoot me an email. Um, I appreciate you guys hanging in with me and I hope I was able to give you a good foundation and I hope you were all um, doing well and staying safe and exercising self-care um, during our coronavirus crisis. And if this is post-coronavirus and things are different, I still hope you're staying safe and taking care of yourself. Um, all right, thank you so much.